Okay. Let's go. Get your books out. We're going to begin our class. The book itself is going to be our source book for the entire semester. Please phones away. And computers only open to blank pages. Thank you so much. Otherwise, everyone's looking over your shoulder, seeing what you're updating on Facebook and all your other stuff. I don't want to deal with that. So let's begin. This is a course on Shabbat. This is not like anything you've done before. It is a new course in terms of the information you're going to learn. And in this course, we're going to learn absolutely nothing about how to keep Shabbat. That is another course that I teach on Tuesdays and Thursdays here at Stern College, the laws of Shabbat. The laws of Shabbat, however, will not be learnt in this class. And the reason I created this class is because I had people in that class who said to me, Rabbi, you teach me all these laws and all these details and there's so much to do and so much of my life is about Shabbat and yet, why? And I say to them, well, I can't go into it because I don't have time. Because we've got to learn the laws of Shabbat. And by the way, in that course, we never get through the entire class uh, in course book. I said, I don't have time. And every year I have that, and they would interrupt the class. They'd, so I can't pull a raisin out of a bowl full of raisins and peanuts. Why? What is that about Shabbat? Why, why, why? So what I did was, a number of years ago, and I've increased over the years, I built an entire course of information about... So about 30 classes will crunch into about 26 as to why we keep Shabbat, the reasons behind it, which I think will be helpful because if you do keep Shabbat, or if you have any relation with Shabbat, you'll find that you'll spend a seventh of your life in this world. There's only one Yom Kippur, there's only one Rosh Hashanah, there's only one Sukkot, there's only one Tisha B'Av, thank God, but there are 52 Shabbats every year. So if you're going to spend so much time in that world, you'd better think of a reason and know the reasons why. And there are many, many reasons. We're going to look at many different Jewish sources, obviously from the Torah, look at Talmud, Rishonim, Acharonim, even modern day sources, try to figure out what this day is all about. And I'll start with an interesting insight, I think. And by the way, you can always ask questions along the way. And that is, it's funny, we define people, Jews, as being observant or not, by their relationship to Shabbat. Right? We say, is that person, is that person Shomer Shabbat, Shomer Shabbat? We don't say, is that person a sukkah dweller? Are they a matzah eater? Right? We don't say that. We say, are they Shomer Shabbat? That seems to be the defining reality when it comes to the individual. This course is going to discover why that is. Why we put so much emphasis on this one day as opposed to anything else. Why it seems to be the gateway into Jewish observance, why it seems to be the connecting tissue between a Jew and God and Judaism, and why, and this is going to be a big part of it, why is Shabbat so detailed? Why there's so many laws? And the laws are so specific, so minute, and as we'll see, there's only one other area in Judaism, in Jewish life, in Jewish history, that has so much minute and fine detail when it comes to Shabbat, like Shabbat. And actually that, we'll see in a few moments, even today possibly, is going to be related to it. So this really is a course book because I found, like, rather than using one book, I want to kind of throw it all in there. Um, there will be a midterm, which will be worth half the final grade, and a final worth half, and the rest is going to be on uh, attendance, which I expect. So I'll be taking attendance every single class. But first we have to introduce this topic, because it's one of these topics that most people have like, you know, have really thought about, strangely enough. Um, let's begin with an introduction by a great rabbi who sadly passed away in unfortunate circumstances uh, not that many years ago, but wrote a number of books in his life. Very great man. I never got to meet him, but I've heard his classes um, live. His name is Rabbi Shimshon David Pincus. And we're just going to use him for introduction to the course. So the introduction is going to take us maybe two, three classes, just to figure out what's going on. Because we're getting, a, getting our heads into a whole different sphere of thinking. And uh, the first few pages are uh, numbered uh, via letters. 
and then all the numbers begin. So we're going to start on page A. There should be an A on the top right-hand corner of your first page. Um, another point of interest, I'm going to be translating all the Hebrew. This is a low intermediate class. So I'll be translating all the Hebrew uh, as we go along. However, um, there will be certain Hebrew words and phrases that I'll put up on the board or I'll uh, point out to you. Those are Hebrew words that need to be learned because they're phrases and they're teaching you something. Okay, so it's not learn Hebrew with Rabbi Hajioff, but as we'll see, actually in this course more than probably any other course I've done, some Hebrew words are going to reveal ideas to us which you just can't get from the English. Okay? And um, so we'll be doing that and you expect to know those words and their relationship and their connections to different ideas we'll be looking at. Any questions on anything I've said so far? Shall we begin? Are you all excited? Might as well be. You're stuck with me. I'm happy to have you. Your parents are paying. And uh, might as well enjoy it. I mean, if you're flying, you might as well get miles for it, right? I mean, right? Okay. Let's begin. Shabbat Kodesh, Kirva Labora Olam. This is the Holy Shabbat. Now, those are two words we have to figure out, the word Shabbat and Kodesh, but we shall do that. But he starts with a question. And he says, Morabai say, my friends, Eifa tachana shesham pogshim b'yimuchet Hashem b'yibarach. Where is the, the station? Where is the tachana? Right. You know, those who started in Israel, you have a tachana merkazit. He's like, is there a station that we have where we meet God? Is there a certain place where we meet God, a station, a tachana? Where is it? How do we bring God and spirituality and Judaism into our lives? Where is that? Is there such a place? He says, and this is the perfect introduction to our course, Kodesh. It's going to be the Sabbath. Shabbat. Shabbat is the answer. That is what it's all about. This is the entry, the gateway into Jewish life. The zu hamuhut shel Shabbat Kodesh. Mahut means the, the essence of Shabbat. That's what it's all about. Everything we do, everything we don't do, and we'll discuss the idea of why on different aspects of halacha, of what we do and don't do. It's all going to be obviously applicable because it's all one thing. But he says when everything is said and done, that's what it is. It is the place where you meet God. And he says, well, first of all, let's try to define what Shabbat actually is. What is Shabbat? Okay, what is it? What is it? Well, first of all, let me ask you, what does the word even mean? What does the word Shabbat even mean? Yes. Rest. It means to rest. Okay. That seems to be the typical translation. Anybody else? Um, oh, dear. And the Piskin, where'd you get that from? Shuv is to return. Yeah. Anyone see that? Teshuva. Shuv means to return. It's definitely in there. It may not be the direct translation of the word, but it's in there. But we'll put it in. To return. Right? Let's get to the word Shuv. Right? As in Teshuva, which is to return. Shuv. And that's gonna we're gonna do two or three classes just on that one concept about the returning ability of Shabbat. To return us where and when and how we shall see. Okay, anyone else? Okay, so let's go on from there. So he says, What is Shabbat? And he says, You see, when it comes to the other Jewish holidays, we know what's going on. When it comes to Pesach, we know why we celebrate Pesach, or we should know. Why do we celebrate Pesach? Exodus from that is correct. Okay. What do we read on Pesach to remind us of that story? The Haggadah. Anu Omrim. Haggadah. Right? Sorry, it says Anu Omrim. Haggadah. Ma'od Ruah. The definition is very, very clear. And Pesach is Zman Cherutenu. It is a time of our freedom. Cherutenu. Our freedom. That's Pesach. 
That we know. And it's very clear. You read the Haggadah. You sit around the Pesach table. You don't eat chametz. You eat matzah. You lean. You drink four cups of wine. You do what you need to do on Pesach. And he got it. Why? Because we were slaves in Egypt and God took us out. Okay. Okay, Shemigim was Sukkot. And we get to Sukkot. Why do we keep Sukkot? That is Zman. I don't remember who was on my course last year, last semester. What was Sukkot? It was like dwelling. It was dwelling. But what was the essence of the holiday? Harvesting, Harvesting is definitely Baruch Haga Asif is correct. It was oh, referred to as that. The rain. The rain was part of it as well. You learned a lot last semester, didn't you? Yeah. Simcha Tenu, our happiness. Remember that? The joy of Simcha, of Sukkot. Zman Simcha Tenu. We said the word Simcha applies and appears more in relationship to Sukkot than any other holiday. To have our happiness and our freedom. That's because rain is coming, we now have wealth, and we just gathered in the crops. Right? It's all related to that as well, so you're all correct. So we know what that's about. Okay, Shmigim or Rosh Hashanah, when Rosh Hashanah comes around, Everyone knows Zman Shal Shofar. Shofar is the mitzvah of the day, the wake up call. If you remember from last semester, remember that? We spoke about that. Right? Shofar, so good. We did that. <laughs> Mishpat, that's judgment. The world is judged. The Yira, Shemayim. And we are at awe of heaven. The Chain Shavuot. And when it comes to Shavuot, what's Shavuot all about? What's Shavuot all about? It's not rhetorical. You can answer. Shavuot, what's the holiday of celebrating? Matan Torah. Torah. Thank you, Alexandra. That's absolutely right. Matan Torah. Torah is given to the Jewish people at Mount Sinai in the Jewish year 2448. So we know what happened. Events happened. We recall it. And we celebrate it. Commemorate it. Relive it. Zman Matan Torah Tenu. Aval Ma Shabbat. So what's Shabbat all about? See, I know historically what happened on the Jewish holidays. And I get to relive it on the same day, and he could have had a Tisha B'Av over here, a Yom Kippur, right? Purim, Hanukkah. What's Shabbat all about? What are we going to say in our tefillah about this? Remember, the tefillah, the prayers of the day, reflect the holiday itself. This is Yom Shabbat, Zman. So what is the Zman? What is the Zman? Well, Zman is important over here. It's an important word. We discussed it last semester in a different context, but we should mention it here. Zman we mentioned means... Zman means... Zimun. What did you say? Zimun. Zimun, you said. So we, what does the word mean in English? It means time, but it's related to another word, which is zimun, which is to... Prepare. prepare. Because time is prepared for us. Okay? That's man. So Zman Cheretain, the time of our freedom, right? It's Zimun, from the beginning of creation, time was set up. The fabric of time was set up with these ideas instilled inside it. Okay, so that's Zman. So what's the Zman? I know that on Pesach I go free. It's the Zman of my freedom. I know on Sukkot I'm going to be happy. Zman Sefateinu. I know on uh, Shavuot I get the Torah. Zman Matan Toretainu. What's the Zman? What is the time? What is invested in this day of Shabbat? What's, ha- what's the Zman giving me? Every holiday gives me something. Either I get to be happy, or I get to go free, or I get to do teshuva, I get my entire slate cleaned. I can, I'm always, what is Shabbat doing though? What is the Zman itself? That's the question. And he says, I like a filled fish, that's it. I meant to eat a little fish patty with no bones in it. That's what it's all about. Right, what's Shabbat? Eating cholent. Now, cholent's good. And actually, eating cholent has a strong historical and political reasoning behind it as well, as well as halachic, as we shall see when we get to the idea as well. So I'm not putting down filth fish or cholent. These are very, if you have cholent, or you may have uh, dafina, or chamin, right? All the same thing. You know where the Sholent comes from, where Sholent means? Sholent? I don't know what language it is. Probably German. No, it's Polish. French. It's French. Anyone here speak French? What does Shod mean? Shod. Hot. What's Lent? Long. Slow. Hot and slow. It's a food that is cooked and kept hot 
and it's slow. Kept on the fire all of Shabbat. There you go. That's true. Dochamim means the same thing. It's just hot. Right? From Cham. Right? There's reasons why we eat it. We'll get to that. Okay. But it's like, that's all it is. Just eating these foods. Mazah Shabbat. But what is it? Betitan lanu zman. He makes a joke. Maybe it's time to not learn Torah. Just to like sit back and do nothing at all. Ze Shabbat. She'en stira yeshiva. Well, the shivas are all closed. So we just sit at home and just like sleep all, all day. Don't tell me if you do. I don't want to know. Okay. So he says, what is it exactly? So turn over the page. So he's going to give his definition. And... This will help us for the remainder of the course. So this is really, we're introducing, but it's gonna give us an outlook for all of the course. And another important point, which I've left out. We're not just learning about Shabbat. This is also very, very important. Shabbat is going to be a paradigm for everything else in Judaism. So we're gonna learn about different philosophical, cultural, historical aspects of Jewish life but we're going to use Shabbat as a way to get there. And there's a reason why Shabbat can help us do that. Kosher would not help us do that. Uh, Purim would not help us do that. Purim would help us learn other things. And Kosher helps us learn other things. And Mezuzah will help us learn different things. But Shabbat, we're going to see, is going to encapsulate everything you need to know about being Jewish, every area of Jewish life. So we're going to use Shabbat as well as a springboard into discussing different philosophical ideological, cultural, historical aspects of Jewish life, because it's all in Shabbat. Really, Shabbat has within it past, present, and future. You can only understand the Messiah, Mashiach, by understanding Shabbat as well, as we shall see. It's all tied in. Why Shabbat was chosen for this, we'll see, but it's all tied in. B, page B. Utashuvahi, let me give you the answer, he says. Shabbat hiyom she. It's the day we are pogish, we meet God. Look what he says. Yom Shalom Shizbrach. What is the definition of Pesach we got? Shavuot we got? Sukkot we got? Yom Kippur we got? What? Shabbat? Shabbat is? And this is the best definition you can ever get. God day. God day. What are you talking about, Rabbi? Aren't all Jewish holidays God day? Isn't Tuesday God Day? Yeah. But this is all about God. You see, the other holidays that I mentioned already are all about us. I need to go free, so I keep Pesach. I need Semcha, so I keep Sukkot. They're all about me. And if they're not totally about me, they're half me and half Hashem. Chetzi la Hashem and Chetzi Aleichem. Half for you and half for Hashem. Shabbat actually, and this is very unusual, is all about God, it's not about you at all. Now we have to figure that out. Yeah? What did you say about Zman? Zman is God day, he says. The day we meet God. That is the definition he's giving, and I like it so much, I have to begin the course with it. Everything we're going to see is going to come from that. So how does that correlate to time? That's what the time is. The time is that it's the station where you meet God. Okay, we're still building up. He'll give us a bit more clarity. But that's what the time is. That's the essence of the time. In other words, there's no, there's nothing else. There's nothing else on that day. That's why you'll notice there's no object per se that we use on Shabbat. Okay, we use certain things on Shabbat. We make wine, we use wine for Kiddush, we use challah for meals. But those aren't the objects of the day. On Pesach, you've got to eat the matzah. Well, you missed the whole point. Right? On Rosh Hashanah, you've got to hear the shofar. On Sukkot, you've got to sit in the sukkah. On Shabbat, there's no real object. We use certain things, but they, they, they don't become the essence of the day. Yeah. How does that like, tie in with like, that works for however long then rests on Shabbat? Like, isn't that We're going to come to that. Um, That's going to come to that as well. That's it. We do nothing. That's the whole point. How do you get around that, though? Like, that way it's like rest? Like, oh, well, the question is, what, yeah, your question is why why Shabbat rest? What are we resting? No, not the rest that you're thinking of. It's different. It's very, very different. Now, you can rest on Tuesday. 
if it was just a day of rest, I would change it. I'd make uh, every day Shabbat from 8 to 10. No phone, no work, nothing. Sit back. That would be a little more restful. Right? Why do an entire day for it? You have to figure that. There's something, else, something going on over here. Something's cooking over here. And it's not just the chillant. See what I did there? You like that, right? Okay. Hamila Shabbat. What does the word Shabbat say? So he actually is going to change the definition, give you a different definition. He sha'olam shatek. He's like, really, the best definition is not rest, it's shatek. It's quiet. There's silence. Absolute silence. Shabbat mipulat gashmit. I am removing myself from all physicality. Now, again, that has to be understood because. All we do is we eat and we drink and we sing and we enjoy. So I don't know what he's talking about. We're gonna figure that out. He says, Yesh rak et Olam. All that exists is God. This allows us this silencing and removing ourselves from physical world and physical desires is gonna allow us and connect us and stick us, right? Seal us, connect us to the spiritual world. Okay? And he's not going to tie this in to a famous statement by the rabbis about an event in Jewish history. Okay? And this connection is not his connection. This is made, as we'll see when we go through the Jewish sources that discuss this, a number of times. And there's a reason why this connection is made happens to be that this event did happen on Shabbat. That is not a coincidence. And that is Mahmoud Har Sinai, the giving of the Torah to the Jewish people on Mount Sinai. So that's the first connection we're going to see, the first historical connection. He's going to mention it, but we'll see a lot more later on. But Mahmoud Har Sinai, when the Jewish people stood at Sinai, we're now four lines down, those who are following. God gave us the Torah. There is a Midrash that tells us the entire world was silent. Part of the Sinai experience was the world was silent. And then it gives this beautiful, whether it be allegorical, metaphorical, I'm not sure, maybe it's real. Tzipor Lotzitz, the birds didn't chirp, right? And it goes on over there, and the animals didn't make sounds. All of creation was completely silent at that time. Ha'olam Gashmi the entire physical world stopped. Va'az Nishma, and because it was so silent and so quiet, everyone could hear God say, Anochi Hashem Alakecha, I'm the Lord your God. Hmm, that's interesting. See, he's like, it's not rest. You need quiet, you need disconnect in order to understand what's going on. Just like at Mount Sinai, where there was complete silence, a complete disconnect, and then we were able to hear Anochi Hashem Alakecha, so to on Shabbat, he says, it's a very similar silence. And by the way, as I mentioned, Matan Torah did happen on Shabbat. Matan Torah, he be Shabbat, was on Shabbat. Ki be Shabbat ha'olam hagash mi batel. Because when Shabbat comes around, the entire world is batel. I wonder what the word batel means? Nullified. Right? We nullify it. It's gone. We're not involved in making a living. We're going to see, you go to Jewish law, you can't even talk about it. You can't even think about it. You are, dis I am disconnecting. I'm entering a completely different world when I come into Shabbat. Okay? Yesh, Rakakarish Bo, there is only God. And we are invited to God's meal. That's what's happening. This does not apply on any other holiday. This applies on Shabbat or any other meal. We are invited to God's table for a meal, which helps us understand another idea which you may have heard, and that is that the food on Shabbat, the bill of the food on Shabbat is covered by God. Which is why in Rosh Hashanah, the entire year and how much money you're gonna make is all set up. But education for children, Torah education, and the food for Shabbat is part of a different cheshbon, different accounting, whatever that means. It's on a different account. 
and panasav enter the olam. Yeshua Kadosh Baruch Hu mazmin otan lasura etzlo. We get invited to his meal. Um mafdiach lano and he guarantees that he assures us shim nikayem shalosh suda b'shabbat. If if you if we're able to eat the three meals of Shabbat, yetzil otanu we get saved megibul paraniot from three punishments. Mechev leshal Mashiach from the birth pangs of Mashiach. Medina shal Gehenim, the judgment of Gehenim, and Milchamat Gog and Magog, and the final war before the Messiah comes. How that comes into Shabbat, we're going to see later on in the course. But we're going to see that Olam Haba, Mashiach, Gog and Magog, all the Gehenim are all very much related to Shabbat. Very, very, very much. The im nit aneg itobi Shabbat, and if we have oneg, now this is another important word. Again, all these words I'm going to just put out now, write them down, learn them, and later on the course we'll open them up a little bit more. But oneg is what Shabbat is called in the Torah. Oneg, pleasure. Right now, I remember from your childhood, you went to synagogue or NCSY, you had an oneg Shabbos, and it was laffy taffies for everyone, right, and corn chips. So. Before it was that. It's also that. It's an idea. Right? We're in a world of oneg. The Ramban, we'll see later on the course, says if you rearrange those letters, you get nega, which is destruction. A blemish. You don't want nega, he says. You want oneg. He says that's Kabbalah. Those who understand, he says, understands. But he says Shabbat is what the Torah t- calls Oneg is what the Torah calls Shabbat. The Karati Lo Oneg. It's an Oneg. Okay. Yeten Lanu Nachala Belimitzarim. And we get given, says the Gemara, it's all from the Gemara. We get given a Nachala inheritance without any problems. If you jump down to the bottom of the page, let's keep going, go as far as we can today. And we'll try to sum it up because we said a lot, but we've got a lot more to say. Chazal Omrim. The Gemara, the rabbis tell us in the tractate of Shabbat, Al Shabbat Kodesh, about the Holy Shabbat, and why Shabbat is called Kodesh, we're going to spend about three classes looking at as well. Why it is given such a name. Actually, the first time the word Kodesh appears in the Torah is in relation to Shabbat. So there is an intrinsic connection between Kedusha, holiness, and Shabbat. The Vilna Gon and others say, the first time a Hebrew word appears in the Torah is where it gets its essence from. The essence comes from that thing. The first time the word Kodesh appears is in relation to Shabbat. Therefore, if you understand what holiness is in any other context, you've got to understand Shabbat. Because it is the source, the makor, the shoresh of all holiness in this world. Okay, but hang on to that. It says about Shabbat, Matan schara lo avid legloi. The gift of reward is not revealed to us. The tremendous reward for this one day, we don't understand. Haschar shezochan akabal Shabbat, the tremendous reward we receive. Hamatanot the flot shesh b'Shabbat, the tremendous gifts. I would highlight that word, we're going to revisit it. The gift of Shabbat. We're going to spend a few classes just on that, one or two classes, just on that one word, matana. Hem star v'loglim, they are hidden. We don't even fully appreciate it, which is one of the problems. We keep Shabbat, and we don't really see the tremendous reward that comes from it. Zohu, Zoe, all I see by Shalom Yodim, let's have Shabbat. Maybe that's why we don't know how to get stuff out of Shabbat. Why Shabbat's so important? Yesh Klaub Olam, he says there is a principle in this world that says, the more beautiful a gem, the more beautiful a gem or a diamond, the more hidden they are. The more something is beautiful, the more hidden it is. Which is true, right? The Torah is precious. We hide it in a covering, which goes into an ark, behind a curtain, right? The more precious and beautiful something is, the more we cover it up. He says Shabbat is one of those things. It's got so many covers around it that it's hard for us to understand, to see behind the covers, see how special it is. He's going to be like, we have to uncover it to appreciate its tremendous beauty. That's what it means by 
we don't fully understand its greatness. But actually, Shabbat is called Ma'ayin HaBrachot. It is the source of all blessing. HaMa'ayin. She'ev Shalashov. This is a spring, if you will. She'ev Shalashov Mishavet. Kol Shalom. We're going to see, we're going to spend a few classes just on this idea of the blessing power of Shabbat. It is going to be the source, the Makor HaBracha, as we sing on Shabbat. Et Kala Hatzlacha Shabena Torah Sarech Efshal Shabbat Shabbat. All success that you have in life, whatever it is, without you even realizing it, is coming from Shabbat. That's where it's coming from. Okay. We have this so far, yeah? Any questions on anything we discussed? This is just an introduction. We're going to double click on all of these areas and look at the different commentaries to understand them. But that's the basic understanding. What we're going to do now for the remaining time we have together, and we'll pick this up next class, is try to find out something very unusual. And it goes like this. Shabbat is a time. Right? It's a zman. Nachon? Now, if that's true, we have to figure out why women are obligated to keep Shabbat, because women are not obligated in time bound mitzvot. We'll spend a few cla uh, one class discussing that later in the semester. But it's a time. Okay? And as we're going to see, it is the holiest time. Contrary to popular Jewish belief, especially here in America, Yom Kippur is not the holiest time. Shabbat is the holiest time. Right? If I had my way, I'd ban Yom Kippur. It's become, unfortunately, to represent all of Judaism, which by the way, it's probably the greatest violation that's happened to our people. You have all these Jewish kids growing up in secular homes, going to synagogue once a year, maybe twice, on Yom Kippur, and saying, wow, this is Judaism. And they go to college, and we're like, ah, so what's being Jewish? You're like, well, I fast once a year, and I made a lot of money in my bar mitzvah. <laughs> right? It's a great shame. And when these people say to them, oh, did you hear about Jesus? I'm like, I'm sorry, Jesus, Jesus loves you. Jesus, God. Wow, I mean, there's Judaism. Didn't tell me this. I just, you know, went to Hebrew school, tortured a little bit, and then uh, bar mitzvah, that was the end of it. That was my graduation. I was surprised all these Jews leave the fold and the faith. I would ban Yom Kippur and make them understand what Shabbat's all about. Shabbat, we're going to see, is going to have a lot more power in bringing, shuv, bringing Jews back to Yom Kippur. I'm not putting Yom Kippur down. Very special day. I keep it, I learn about it, I teach about it, but it's secondary. And by the way, this isn't just me speaking. There's actually proofs to show the Yom Kippur is secondary in nature to Shabbat. Actually, the only reason Yom Kippur is Yom Kippur is because it's called Shabbat Shabbaton. Shabbat makes Yom Kippur, not the other way around, as we shall see. Okay, so Shabbat is the time. Yes? If Shabbat is holier than Yom Kippur, then why does Yom Kippur override Shabbat when they overlap? It doesn't override, they combine. They're able to combine. Yom Kippur cannot take any other day, but Yom Kippur combines together with Shabbat because actually they do the same thing in different ways, but they match up. That's why, that's why you know you have to keep the laws of Shabbat on Yom Kippur. Right? Jewish holidays you don't have to. You can do Ochel Nefesh, you can cook. You can't Yom Kippur, but it's called Shabbat Shabbaton. Sabbath of Sabbaths. That's the key connection. But Yom Kippur allows Shabbat to enter because they're actually one thing. Yeah. If it's like the Shabbat of all the Shabbats, then wouldn't that make it? No, Shabbat is also called Shabbat Shabbaton. <laughs> That's where he got it from. It's called Shabbat Shabbaton. But Shabbat is also called that. So Shabbat gives it the power to do that. We'll see it inside. Yeah? The others are called Shabbaton. But Shabbat Shabbaton gives a very special status. Okay. As well as a time, Shabbat is also related to something else. And that is space. Or in Hebrew, makom. Makom. So if Shabbat is the holiest time, what's the holiest space? Place. This is not a trick question. You can answer. What's the holiest space in the world? 30 students, a lot of silence in here right now. 
What is the holiest place in the world? <coughs> Jerusalem. Thank you very, very much. What's well, a trick question? And also CNN, you can say it. <laughs> you can say it. You don't say Tel Aviv, which is also holy. It's also part of Eretz Israel, but Yerushalayim is much holier. Is it gonna, a whole semester of this we've got to have? Okay, what's the holiest place in Yerushalayim? Sorry? The, uh, well, presently the Kotel, but holier than the Kotel, the Kotel is just a wall that surrounds the mountain. Har Habayit is the holiest place. That's why you can go to the Kotel, but you're actually not allowed to go up onto uh, Har Habayit Temple Mount, because we are not Tahor. So the Makam Mikdash, okay? So what was, the, what was on that mountain? Right now there's nothing except uh, a mosque, right? But what was there before? The Tibetan Temple in Jerusalem, right? And before it was the Temple in Jerusalem, it was a portable structure, which was what? The Mishkan, okay? It was the Mishkan. So vast, the holiest place is the Mishkan, right? the portable tabernacle that was built and created in the Midbar and carried this for 40 years, disassembled, reassembled, disassembled, reassembled. How many times? 42 times. 42 journeys usually went through. The evident errors as well eventually became the Beit HaMikdash in Yerushalayim, in Jerusalem. So I'm going to matter what the teacher on the internet, what I was going to tell you, Yerushalayim is the holiest place for the Jewish people and has been for thousands of years. So what we're going to have to do is, and if you do laws of Shabbat, this is all you do, but at least as an understanding, we're going to see there is a strong connection and a number of them, at least five or six that we're going to look at, between Shabbat and the Beit HaMikdash. Between Shabbat and the Beit HaMikdash. Okay. This connection comes on many levels and many layers in different ways. The laws of Shabbat are all learnt out from the Mishkan. If you're not aware, I shall show it to you. The ideas of Shabbat, the minute reality of every law is found on Shabbat as it is in the Mishkan, unlike any other era of Judaism. So what we're going to do is we're going to connect these two realities. Okay? Let's just start right now and then we will look a little bit deeper into it. The Mishkan had inside it a number of items. Those were my class yesterday, we did this actually, as an introduction to the Halacha course. Would you like to name for me some of the items that were in the Mishkan? It's a trick question, there's a list. Phones away please. What items were in the Mishkan? Shout them out. Yeah. Not all at once. Yeah. The Kior is correct. The Kior. The Menorah. The Shulchan. What was the Shulchan? What was the Shulchan? Okay, I need some help over here. What's a Shulchan? A table. table. Was there a table in the Mishkan, the Beit Migdash? Yeah. Yes. What was on it? The there were breads. What are the breads called? Lechem apanim, the face breads. That is correct. Why are they called face breads? Because they were open or show breads. Many Chumash will translate it because the side of it was shown. How many were there? Twelve. Six and six. There were twelve of them. There were twelve of them. What else was in the Beit Migdash? The Aaron, that's correct. What was the Aaron? The Aaron was a... What was it? A box made of wood. What was inside the wooden box? Gold box. What was inside that gold box? Another wooden box. What was inside... I said it was wood. Gold. Wood. What was inside that wood box? Very good. The Luchot. Ten Commandments. That Moshe Rabbeinu chiseled. Right. That he created. What else? The man. There was a little vial of man. That's interesting. It was kept next to it. What else? 
It's not an official part of the Beit of the Mishkan. There was another one for the Ketoret, right? The Mizbeach Ketoret, right? That is correct. Incense altar. The incense altar. Before that? I don't remember. The man. The man. There's a little vial of money kept there for a while, yeah. There was a Mizbeach for meat. The Mizbeach, there was spring sacrifices, right? The Mizbeach, the sacrifices. What were they pour on the Mizbeach? Oh. Oh, wait. Water? Water. You see, you're right, oh, no. but since you took my Sukkot class, I'm you're confusing. still in the Sukkot. You're not confusing. Uh, you're poured. saying, right, it was poured once you're in Sukkot. That was last semester. Mm -hmm. Once a year, on the Simchat Beit HaShoeva, they would pour water. Very good. The rest of the year, they would pour Oil. wine. wine. Yain. And they would pour an item on there, a very, very expensive item. Nowadays, not so expensive. Back then, it was. What was that item they would pour onto it? Or they would actually put onto all the meat? Salt, melach is correct. Salt. Don't put salt, melach on everything. All the things have to be salted. Now, one second. Let's put this together and write down this list. We have this thing called the Mishkan, and it had a kior, would wash hands, and feet, by the way. And there was a menorah that would bring light. And there was a shulchan, a table, that had lechem panim, breads on it. And there was a mispeach with meat, and there was wine, and there was salt, and there was nice smells. What does this sound like? Shabbat. 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 This is not coincidental. Not coincidental at all. As we shall see. very, very much connected and was done deliberately. It was done deliberately. Okay, let's stop over there. Wonderful class. Good introduction. We will continue our introduction for another two classes before we begin the main information.